Hello everybody, my name's Brodie Quinn. I'm an emergency physician uh, and the clinical lead for ultrasound at Toowoomba Hospital. We're gonna go through a quick video tutorial today looking specifically at the pathologies that we're trying to diagnose in our focused echo and life support point of care ultrasound protocol that we've got here locally. You might've seen our previous video looking specifically about the protocol itself, optimizing images and just acquiring these images. This is a follow-up to that then, looking specifically at the different pathologies in the shocked or critically unwell patient. What we really wanna do when we're look, thinking about focused echo and bedside echo is remembering that we're not cardiologists, we're not echo sonographers, so we need to keep our questions that we're asking really simple. And we're looking specifically at four different pathologies. So, is there evidence of acute right ventricular strain which would be evidence for a PE in our critically unwell patient? Is there evidence of a pericardial effusion? And if there is evidence of a pericardial effusion, is there evidence of cardiac tamponade in the ultrasound, which you can then apply your clinical reasoning to when you're looking at your patient? How is the left ventricular size and function in this patient? Is there LV dysfunction? And last of all, what is the fluid status of the patient? Are they underfilled, overfilled, or is it normal? And how can you incorporate that into the care of the patient that you've got in front of you? So we're gonna go through using videos of pathologies, and then we're gonna put in there some normal images so you guys hopefully get a comparison of what it looks like when there is pathology there. I'd really encourage you though, you need to be looking at your patient from a clinical perspective with all of this. If it doesn't make sense clinically, then it's probably your echo skills as opposed to the echo that you're undertaking. All right, so we're gonna talk about the pathologies now for focused echo and life support, uh, specifically looking at some examples and comparing them to a normal scan so you can pick up these diagnostic features on an echo. We're gonna start with uh, right ventricular strain, which I think is one of the bigger ones that people are wanting to look for in the critical care setting, because as it is, pulmonary embolus is a difficult diagnosis to make. I'll say from the get uh, from the get go that it's it's really imperative that you use your clinical reasoning when it comes to making this diagnosis because there are many other pathologies that will cause acute or right ventricular strain pattern on an echo that may not necessarily be a PE. So you're looking for the people that are short of breath, shocked, hypoxic, and then you're adding that that information that you've already synthesised to then the scans that you've acquired, okay? So the best uh, images when you're looking at RV strain and PE in critical care are going to be your subcostal window purely because if there's CPR ongoing, then you get a good look at the chamber sizes. Ideally, what you really want is your parasternal short axis and your apical four chamber, um, and then comparing them with your IVC and putting that information together. Pulmonary embolus causes obstructive shock. So you should also have a distended, non-collapsing IVC for these patients. So in summary for RV strain, what are we looking at? We're looking at a patient that's shocked. They are potentially hypoxic, but not always hypoxic. And you've got a focused echo that's got a right ventricle that is larger or similar size to the left ventricle. You're looking for D sign in your parasternal short axis. And then you're also looking for McConnell's sign in your apical four, and then the RV being large in the apical four chamber. And then last of all, looking at your IVC, making sure, seeing if there's an IVC that is non-distending and large. All of those things put together in your patient, you'd be pretty convinced that they've got a pulmonary embolus. So the next pathology we're gonna talk about is pericardial effusion. Uh, and specifically in critical care setting, we're using focused echo and life support to diagnose pericardial effusion, and then creating, making the diagnosis of cardiac tamponade, obviously you need to intervene in that situation. From the get-go, it's really important to recognise that, again, similar to all the other ones, you need to use your clinical reasoning for this. Just because someone has a pericardial fusion does not mean they have cardiac tamponade. However, in our patient population, if someone comes in with shock and they've got a significant pericardial effusion, you have to consider that as the cause if you don't find an alternate cause for their shock state. So we're gonna go through what images we're gonna look at to actually diagnose a pericardial effusion. So the best windows for this are your subcostal four chamber view, your apical four chamber view, and your IVC view, 
purely because you get a good view subcostally, even in cardiac arrest when you're doing CPR and you could diagnose and uh, demonstrate the size of the pericardial effusion. The apical four chamber gives you a really good look through both the right ventricular free wall as well as the right atrium, which we use then to diagnose right the intrapericardial pressure overload. And then last of all, the IVC, because again, pericardial effusion causing tamponade is obstructive shock. So you should have a distended IVC. So the window that we're looking at here, this is a subcostal window looking at the a pericardial effusion. So the first question you need to ask is, is it there or not? Yes, there is a pericardial effusion there, okay? The next thing we need to know is, is this pericardial effusion causing hemodynamic compromise? So there's two things for that. There's a clinical status of the patient and there's the sonographic evidence of basically RV underfilling because the pericardial pressure is higher than the right side of the heart's pressure. So two things we look at. We're looking at the right atrium. Does the right atrium collapse at any stage in the cardiac cycle, generally in late systole and early diastole? And then does the right ventricular wall collapse at all in diastole, okay? So what that really means is, is there impaired filling of the right ventricle because of this pericardial effusion? So you can see here that there is some collapsing of the right atrial wall here. It's difficult to make out any right ventricular wall collapse in this image. So that's your subcostal. We're gonna come across, yeah. Is an image of our apical four chamber here. So. In this image, we can see, first of all, it's always useful, I think, first to look at the right atrium. You can see here that the atrium collapses. We've got right atrial collapse. I'm not gonna measure it here, but its sensitivity and specificity is for greater than one third of the cardiac cycle, but that's significant right atrial collapse going on here. And then the other thing is you can see here that there is some right ventricular wall collapse here as well that we can see, that we can demonstrate there. The way that it was described to me is if you're looking at it there, does someone look like they're jumping on a trampoline on the right ventricle? Which it looks to me very much like that. If that's the case, and that's likely to be right ventricular wall collapse, which is an evidence of pericardial tamponade, okay? Last one we're gonna to go to is have a look at our IVC. So again, putting this all together with your patient, you're expecting then if the intrapericardial pressure is high enough to cause the right atrium to not fill properly, you're going to have backup in your IVC. So you get a big non-distending, non-collapsing rather IVC, which is what we've got here, okay? So putting it all together, you got a patient who has hypotension or shock, who looks unwell, who's got a pericardial effusion on an ultrasound. So you've ticked that, yes, they have a pericardial effusion. The next thing then is, is there evidence of hemodynamic compromise? Clinically, we've already said there is. On the on your bedside echo, then yes, we're looking at some RA wall collapse, we're looking at some RV wall collapse, and we're looking at a descended IVC. Overall, this patient has got cardiac tamponade and you need to fix that. All right, the next pathology we're going to look at, or the next question that we're going to be asking is, what about the LV function uh, in focused echo and life support? So realistically, in the clinical scenario, what we're saying is, is this patient's shock contributed to by left ventricular dysfunction? The key markers which we've talked about and looked at in our previous models, modules here is really looking in 2D imaging how to diagnose LV dysfunction. So this is a parasternal long, and what we want to do in terms of looking at LV function overall, we look through all windows. So there's no specific window that's better than the others. You want to look at all windows, subcostal four chamber, your IVC view, your parasternal long, parasternal short, and apical four chamber, and synthesize that information to see whether or not you think the left ventricular function is normal, mildly impaired, moderately impaired, or severely impaired. So we can look here at some pathology. So this is a parasternal long axis here, looking at uh, a moderately impaired LV function. So the reason I can tell that is because the things we look at, you look overall at the ventricular walls themselves. Are they thick or thin? So normal left ventricular walls are thick 
and they thicken in, in systole and that chamber size should reduce in systole. So you can see here that the left ventricular walls are relatively thick. They do thicken in systole, but not as much as I'd expect. The next thing I look at then is how much velocity is happening for blood throw throughout this left ventricular system. And a marker for that is how well the mitral valve leaflets move throughout the cardiac cycle. So if we pull the cursor up here. If you imagine a line coming from the apex of the heart coming down through the mitral valve here, we would expect that valve to open out and beyond that point. In this patient here, you can see that that valve only opens about to that level, which means there is some left ventricular dysfunction. And I'd say that this, this patient has got moderately impaired LV dysfunction. The last thing that I think is, it's not a sensitive marker, but it's useful to look at is how much squeeze the left ventricular has uh, along the axis. So longitudinal shortening. So basically how much does the annulus of the mitral valve here move in systole? Normal would be one centimetre. We're not doing measurements today, but you can see here that compared to the normal parasternal long axis, this movement in the longitudinal plane is impaired. Okay. We've got an apical four chamber here. So unfortunately, I don't have a good uh, parasternal short for a moderate dysfunction. So what we're doing here again, same thing. So looking at the chamber itself, the left ventricle, this left ventricle looks distended. So it's bigger than the normal left ventricle. The walls themselves don't look as thick or as healthy as a normal left ventricle as well. And again, the velocity of the, of the valve opening and closing isn't as normal or as vivid as what I would expect. It's not moving as well as what I would expect it to. So again, there is some moderate LV dysfunction. Severely impaired left ventricles will usually be quite distended with just a flicker of movement of the LV. And you can see that that's clearly abnormal when you're looking at those, okay? The last thing to look at then is if you've got impaired LV function and you're wanting to know whether or not the patient's shock state is secondary to LV dysfunction, putting all that together, you wanna to have a quick look at their IVC as well. If they have cardiogenic failure, you're expecting their IVC to be large, distended, and not collapsing with the respiratory cycle. So our last question that we ask when we do focused echo and life support is about fluid status in the shock to critically unwell patient. For me personally, I think this is one of the most useful examinations that I do and the most commonly used focused echo question that I'm asking. We're gonna talk about specifically just focused echo today, but remembering that when you're doing uh, a focused echo looking for fluid status, taking into consideration the lungs and looking at lung windows for B lines, particularly in the mid zones and, and apices, adds a lot of information for you as well. So let's go through these here. So the question, so really when you're looking at uh, fluid status, you're wanting to know, one, is the patient underdone with fluid? Do they need more fluid? And what we'd expect to find in that is a heart that is hyperdynamic and an IVC that is underfilled. So again, no specific windows are better than others for this. You're just looking at all of your subcostal, parasternal, apical and IVC windows and making a synthesis of those to, to decide whether or not your patient needs more fluid. So in this one here, we've got a parasternal uh, long axis here and you can see that the heart is quite vigorously contracting and the chamber size is really, really reducing here. So you can see, look at that, the mitral valve leaflet there really flicking out with every beat shows that you've got some hyperdynamic activity of the heart, okay? So that's your long axis there for someone, and this would be indicative of someone that's in a shock state that probably needs some more fluid, but we need to incorporate some other bits of information first. All right, so the short axis, same patient. So here we can see that that left ventricle there, the walls themselves are contracting so much that they're almost kissing, okay? So we are ejecting as much fluid as we're putting into that left ventricle. Again, indicating this is a hyperdynamic left ventricle and they'll probably do with a bit more fluid. Another window here, this is a bit of a skewed apical four. So we're looking at 
in this window here, again, there's a bit of hyperactivity of the heart itself with the left ventricle uh, and the fact that the walls are really squeezing in, squeezing out as much ejection fraction as it possibly can, particularly compared to a normal. And the last thing I'm going to show you now is the IVC, which I think is probably the most useful part of this exam. And realistically, when you're doing this in practice, if you can get a good subcostal four-chamber view and you can see that the heart is hyperdynamic with the right ventricle being relatively small and underfilled, and then you get this view here with a collapsing IVC, then that's going to indicate that this patient needs fluid. There is a lot of talk around and there's, uh, it's a bit, it's difficult and tricky, I think, because it's not overly well studied and a lot of the studies are done in the ventilated patients in ICU. The way that I use this clinically is I think to myself, one, does the patient look like they're underfilled with fluid? Two, what can I see? Do they have a hyperdynamic heart with a collapsing IVC? If the answer to all those three things is yes, we should give them fluid. Okay. You can try a fluid challenge, either a fluid bolus or a passive leg raise and have a look at the left ventricle and seeing whether or not the contractility of the left ventricle improves with that fluid challenge. But overall, I think hyperdynamic state, have a look to see, does the right ventricle look underfilled? Does the left ventricle look hyperdynamic? And does the IVC look like it's underfilled and collapsing? The answer is yes to all of those. The patient needs fluid. The opposite case as well is if the patient has too much fluid, now we don't have any image of this, we'll just talk through it quickly, but if they're fluid overloaded, what would you expect to see? The opposite here, we're gonna see a full non-collapsing IVC. We're gonna see a left ventricle that's struggling a little bit. There might be some moderately impaired LV dysfunction. And then the last thing that I add in that patient is have a look at their lung fields. Have they got some interstitial fluid in their lung fields which is represented by some B lines there. In that case then, that patient's full. You can't contribute more fluid to that patient. You need to be thinking about something else, so adding some presses in. All right, that's it. Thanks for watching. I hope this short video tutorial looking specifically at the pathologies in Focused Echo has been useful to you and you'll be able to use it on the floor. Happy scanning.